decades, the rulers of Latin Christendom had largely ignored calls for help from their crusading brethren in the East. Now, with Jerusalem fallen, the Latin world swung into action. Pope Gregory called for a seven-year truce throughout Christendom so that the rulers could focus on recovering the Holy Land. He also called on all Christians to do penance for their sins, for he insisted that only through sin had Jerusalem been lost. The Pope knew that France was vital to the success of any crusade, and so he at once set to work on securing peace between the King of France, Philip II, and Henry II, King of England and ruler of the vast Angevin Empire, which included Normandy, Anjou, and other portions of modern France. In January 1188, Henry and Philip met at their traditional conference site on the borders of Normandy. Here, the Bishop of Tyre preached powerfully to the two monarchs about the need for a new crusade. The bishop's words deeply moved the crowd, and suddenly the ancient feuding of the two kings seemed meaningless compared to the plight of the Holy Land. Philip and Henry agreed to a peace. On the 21st, both rulers took the cross, that is, vowed to lead their armies in crusade. However, Henry's son, the courageous Richard the Lionheart had already vowed to join the crusade back in November at Tours within hours of receiving news of the fall of Jerusalem. Henry later chided his son for taking the cross without his permission, but Richard's example inspired thousands of others. Throughout France and England, men were taking the cross. The first major power to depart for the East was the Holy Roman Empire led by Frederick Barbarossa. The Imperial Army set out for the East in April, 1189. Barbarossa's crusade is one of the most pivotal episodes in the larger Third Crusade. Although he is nearly 70 years old, Frederick still is an energetic ruler. His long and successful reign has gained him great power across Germany, and he is now eager to crown his career with a campaign to recapture the Holy Land However, Frederick is no naive crusader. As a young man, he fought under Conrad III of Germany, who led an army to the east during the Second Crusade. Frederick well remembers the problems experienced by Conrad's army. Above all, Frederick recalls the dangerous journey across Asia Minor, where the Seljuk Turks had brutally defeated Conrad's knights in 1147. Frederick is eager to avoid Conrad's mistakes and intends to meticulously organize his army for the long campaign. He dispatches envoys to secure safe passage in the lands through which his army must pass on its journey. Frederick exchanges envoys with the Byzantine Empire. Envoys from the Byzantine Emperor, Isaac Angelus, assure Frederick that the German army will be permitted to safely move through Byzantine territory. However, in truth, Isaac views Frederick as an enemy. Recently, Frederick had forged an alliance with the Normans of Sicily, an avowed enemy of Byzantium. Furthermore, Isaac is terrified by the notion of a large German army moving through his territory where it could do immense damage. Ultimately, Isaac believes Frederick's crusade is a fraud and that the German ruler intends nothing less than the conquest of Constantinople itself. Although he's confirmed a peace with Frederick, Isaac contacts the target of the crusade, Saladin, and the two confirm a treaty. Isaac promises Saladin that he will do all that he can to inhibit the German army as it crosses the Byzantine Empire. In addition, Frederick exchanges envoys with another major power that controls part of his route the Seljuk Turks, who rule much of eastern Anatolia. The Seljuk Sultan also agrees to friendship with Frederick, promising that the German crusaders will be able to pass peacefully through Seljuk territory. Having taken care of diplomatic matters, Frederick Barbarossa departs from Regensburg on May 11, 1189, at the head of the largest crusader army ever to set out for the east. Marching with him is his son, Frederick, the Duke of Swabia, and most of the important German nobility. It's a momentous event, 
the crowning achievement of a long and triumphant reign. As the great crusader host passes through the towns of Germany, the citizens cheer. Many feel certain that such a tremendous force led by so wise an emperor will succeed in retaking the Holy Land. Frederick's march proves to be a model of discipline. Historian Christopher Tyerman states, in sharp contrast to Louis VII's ordinances for his crusade army in 1147, Frederick's were enforced. Loudish behavior led to the loss of hands, theft to execution. Such harsh discipline was coupled with a constant emphasis on the pious nature of the operation. The general effect on morale and military effectiveness stood in marked contrast to the shambles into which Conrad III's army had descended in Asia Minor in the autumn of 1147. Frederick and his army passed through Hungary, where King Bela III and his wife, Queen Margaret, a daughter of King Louis VII of France, welcomed them. The Hungarians provide lodging, supplies, and markets for the Crusaders. After a comfortable stay in Hungary, the Germans enter into Byzantine territory on July 2nd. Almost immediately, they are harassed by armed bands. At Nish, Frederick encounters Serbian rebels who ask the Germans to join them in an uprising against the Byzantines. Frederick refuses, stating that his mission is to liberate the Holy Land, not to fight with other Christians. However, as the march continues, Ambushes from local forces intensify. Increasingly, the journey resembles a fighting march. The Germans capture some of their attackers, who, before being hanged, claim that they are acting on the instructions of the Byzantine Emperor. When they reach Sophia on August 13, the Crusaders find that Isaac's promised markets have been withdrawn. After fighting their way through the mountains, the Crusaders reach Philippopolis which has been abandoned by its Byzantine defenders, its fortifications dismantled on Isaac's orders. More than a decade before 1204, the Byzantines are already displaying remarkable confusion and impotence under Isaac's rule. As the Crusaders enter the abandoned Philippopolis, Frederick learns that his envoys at the Byzantine court have been thrown into prison. He also receives tactless communications from Isaac, demanding hostages to guarantee good behavior from the Germans and a share of future conquests. Isaac's refusal to afford Frederick his proper title in this correspondence is the icing on the cake. The Holy Roman Emperor is in no mood to negotiate, especially since it's becoming increasingly clear that he has the military advantage. He responds angrily to Isaac's message, demanding that his envoys be released and that the Byzantines provide peaceful passage to the Crusader army. Isaac releases the envoys, but shows fickleness in making any agreement of peaceful relations. Meanwhile, Frederick's troops occupy Philippopolis and the surrounding territory, securing food and markets through their own prowess. Frederick settles on a strategy to force the Byzantines to cooperate. Isaac Angelus is an understandably nervous ruler. He came to power in a particularly bloody coup, and he himself remains fearful of insurrection. He worries that the very presence of the German army may spark rebellion among already restive regions. Despite Isaac's paranoia, historians today find little evidence to justify the idea that Barbarossa had prior designs on the Byzantine Empire. Christopher Tyerman states, Frederick kept his eyes fixed firmly on the goal of the Holy Land and Jerusalem. He saw himself as a knight of Christ, bound to avenge the events of 1187, not an indiscriminate hammer of Islam or anybody else. Indeed, it's Isaac's own hostility toward Frederick that ultimately provokes German conquest of Byzantine territory. Frederick next captures Adrianople, which he establishes as a headquarters. He occupies Thrace and makes contact with rebels in the Balkans. At this point, Frederick appears to be seriously contemplating an attack on Constantinople. 
Byzantine forces seemed powerless to oppose Frederick's garrisons and foragers. Increasingly panicked, Isaac again asks Frederick to negotiate, only to again abruptly end negotiations on Christmas Eve, just when a deal seems imminent. Isaac's military feebleness and diplomatic schizophrenia cause his policy to implode. The Byzantine chronicler, Nikitas Konyatis, disdainfully records Isaac's incompetence. Left with no choice, Isaac capitulates. In the end, Frederick proves remarkably lenient. On February 14, 1190, he confirms an agreement with Isaac that guarantees the Germans safe passage through the remainder of the empire, ships to carry them across the Hellespont at Gallipoli, and access to markets at reasonable rates. In return, Frederick promises to avoid Constantinople and withdraw from Byzantine territory. For all his bravado, Isaac Angelus has shown himself an impotent, weak ruler whose own paranoia brought on the very disaster he'd initially feared. Byzantine chronicler Nikitas Konyatis judges the whole affair as Isaac himself bringing ruin upon his own empire. The German army next departs Byzantine territory, and yet their greatest challenge awaits them in the lands of the Seljuk Turks. April 25, 1190, the German crusaders at last enter into territory under the control of the Seljuk Turkish Sultan of Rum, Kili Arslan II. Previous agreements with the Sultan had produced promises of friendship, safe passage, and markets for the crusaders in Seljuk territory. However, as in the Byzantine Empire, prior negotiated agreements proved worthless. Unbeknownst to the crusaders, Kili Arslan's son, Qutb al-Din, the son-in-law of Saladin, has effectively usurped his father and is now preparing his forces to oppose the Germans. On May 7, near Philomelium, the Crusaders encounter a Turkish ambush. The Emperor's son, Frederick of Swabia, leads a counterattack that decisively repulses the Turks, who suffer heavy casualties. The Crusaders press on through the rugged terrain, beating back Turkoman raids and increasingly suffering from hunger. Despite these difficulties, the German forces struggle on and maintain incredible discipline. They fight their way to the city of Iconium, the capital of the Seljuk Turks. Although some of the leading men in the army want to press on, Barbarossa insists that they take the city rather than leave it as an enemy stronghold at their rear. On May 18, outside Iconium, the Crusaders come up against Qutb al-Din's main army. What follows is a pitched battle and the most formidable challenge yet faced by Frederick's crusade. The emperor divides All his right, army in two, How's it going? with his son, Duke Frederick, attacking the city, uh, while the old emperor himself... Take the video off here. All right, welcome, folks. Welcome to Tuesday. Hope everybody's doing well. Time for a little coffee in the Crusades. How's the audio sounding for everybody? Ah. Uh, I'll try to keep my energy level up today, guys. Um, uh, my, my, one of my toddlers came in and woke me up pretty early this morning. You guys probably are familiar with it. You know, uh, you hear that little voice, daddy, daddy, daddy. You know, it doesn't matter how deep of a sleep you're in when you're a parent that just wakes you up immediately. <laughs> So I look over and it's like 4.30 or something and I'm thinking, oh, okay. My daughter's standing there. Dad, are you asleep? <laughs> yeah. Crazy about that little girl, for sure. Okay, well, welcome, guys. Uh, I'm glad everybody's here. I hope you enjoyed the uh, little Third Crusade video just to kind of give us a little intro. And... Uh, Chris says, I think you're wearing a hospital shirt because of the Siege of Malta. 
Uh, yeah, I guess we are hitting the Siege of Malta anniversary. So there's the Maltese cross. Looking very good. Which, incidentally, the Hospitallers probably did not... Um, when we're talking about like the 13th century, 12th century, it probably didn't look quite like this. I believe this Maltese cross is more of a later design. And originally it probably would have been just more of a, a uh, standard looking white cross on the black. So, all right. Well, it's good to, good to have everybody here. I, I always enjoy our little hangouts here on Real Crusades History, the live streaming channel. If you have not done so, guys, please do subscribe to this channel. If you're already su subbed on the uh, main channel, this is a good one to also be subscribed to. We do a live stream every Tuesday and Friday here at noon Eastern time, 11 Central time, U.S. time. So, uh, yeah, as I try says, children are wonderful. Yes, they are. Um, you know, I have to say... Um, it is, it's such a, a big change in your life from before you've got kids to when you have kids. And, uh, you know, you just think so differently. And, uh, you know, there's a type of joy you get from having children that is, is hard to hard to explain, I think, to somebody who doesn't have them. Not that everybody is necessarily called to, to that particular uh, life. I think a lot of people are. But there's a level of love, um, you know, that you uh, and a will and, a, and a, an ability to sacrifice yourself for the good of that other person that just kind of goes to the next level when you've got uh, when you've got kids. Um, and I can still remember, uh, you know, my first the first kid my wife and I had uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter. I'll never forget that first night I was, I was uh, in the hospital room, just holding her. It was quiet. My wife was asleep. And I was sitting there with my daughter in my arms, little tiny baby. And just looking at this little girl and just thinking, you know, how in love I was with, with this child and how uh, there was just anything I would do for this little baby. Um, and she, uh, you know, I, I still tell her about that sometimes, <laughs> like when we're doing bedtime and I'm reading a story or something, I'll say, you know, I can remember, oops. I'll say, I can remember when, uh, when you were just a little baby that first night that I ever met you, or the first, the first night we had you. She likes hearing about that. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, anyway, what kind of topics do you guys want to touch on today? What sort of, uh, what sort of discussion points should we dive into? Uh, Crusades topics, medieval topics, whatever you guys are into. Speaking of what, so yeah, uh, get your get your questions going, and I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into some questions with you guys. Um, if you want to send a paid question, that option is available. Not required, of course, but available. Uh, it's just in the description below. It's Power Chat Live, uh, and it's very easy. It's just through PayPal. I'll I'll be watching that to make sure I, I catch those. If you guys. Uh, so, so feel the need. Um, mm. Okay, so we got a good one already from one of our good friends here, Lambert, who says, is there any merit to the circumstantial evidence that exists citing that the Fourth Crusade was in part a result of Alexius Angelus petitioning the papacy? Uh, well, you know, I'll be honest with you, Lambert, I, I don't and then he says to depose his uncle. Um, I can't, I don't remember that directly. Um, I was unaware that that was a big issue with the fourth crusade. My understanding is that it's kind of interesting after the third crusade, crusading kind of ramps up in a big way. Like crusading starts with the first crusade and then it kind of slows down a bit after the second crusade because the second crusade was such a problem. And also because Jerusalem was still, in the hands of the the Christians, but but crusading really comes of age after the Third Crusade because I think of the loss of Jerusalem was such a dramatic and traumatic thing for the Latin Christian world. I really think one thing we kind of um, forget sometimes is the extent to which medieval people felt that God's 
hand was just such a major factor. And I think that a lot of people before the fall of Jerusalem in 1187 really felt that God would not allow that to happen. Uh, once that did happen, that was really, really traumatic. Let's just keep this up here so people know the question we're doing. That was really traumatic for uh, the Latin West. And um, it ignited kind of the renaissance of crusading. I mean, crusades happen, you know, the third crusade happens and Pope Innocent III, who's the most powerful of uh, the medieval popes, he this was his number one priority. He pretty much gets organizing the fourth crusade immediately. So I guess what we could say is that I think it was going to happen whether or not there was an appeal from the Byzantines, but I would not be surprised if there were appeals coming from the Byzantines just because um, there was so much internal, there was, were so many internal problems in, in the Byzantine Empire at the time, which if you guys have seen my latest video, uh, it kind of details that, which I'm glad that video is out there. Um, I definitely got some push pushback from some people. There are a lot of people who really want to focus on the Fourth Crusade as the decisive killing shot to the Byzantine Empire. And I just don't see that at all. I really don't see that as being a legitimate idea. Uh, I think the Byzantine Empire was so internally torn to shreds. Um, some of that began with the Komnenoi, to be honest, but it, it went to a level that's just hard to even overstate under the Angeloi. And I mean, they took they took a position of hostility toward the Crusader states at that point, which is also really intriguing. But all right, then we got another good question. This is from Walker Smith. How's it going, Walker? He says, hey, Jay, can you explain how Crusaders dealt with the heat and how their armor would heat up? Uh, well, I do think we need to keep in mind that, um, you know, the, the way that this armor was worn, your skin wasn't directly touching it. So you had like padded, uh, you had sort of a padded jerkin underneath it, and then you had the armor. And then, of course, we do think that the surcoat was in part to deflect heat, to uh, to reduce, you know, the, the absorption of heat into the armor. But I mean, I think the reality was that the armor was going to get hot, um, but I'm not sure how hot. And you know what? I can kind of speak from some experience a bit here, because uh, when we filmed the Knights of the Cross trailer, we were out in a, a fairly hot part of California. Sorry, guys, I, I'm not talking very well today. We were out in a very hot part of California. The sun was beating down on us. It was kind of almost similar to the conditions you would find in uh, in the Holy Land, you know, during campaigning season, which uh, it wasn't always, it, it was not always just like full on, you know, desert conditions. We have to remember that too. A lot of this warfare happened in more temperate parts of the Holy Land. Uh, the desert wasn't where most of the, the uh, settled areas and castles and things were. Um, and, just given that experience I had, uh, the armor didn't get that hot. It's kind of interesting. I mean, it did, it, it got a little hot, but uh, it mainly stayed kind of a, a more normal. I mean, it, you could touch it. It wasn't, it wasn't hot to the touch. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, one wonders, you know, I think it's more the, the layer and, and I got to actually put on some armor and I put on the full kind of 12th century gear when we were filming that because I was, I did a few little shots in the background so I got a feel for it. And it's it's really the amount of stuff you're wearing that makes you hot. I mean, because you've got everything's covered, your neck. I mean, you got you got a mail thing on your neck, you got the helmet, you've got the arming cap under the helmet, you've got the mail hood, which you I mean, that in itself, like you feel like, you know, you're just you're just this little face sticking out of a a thing. And uh, you know, the the the, the armor is pretty heavy. That's another thing, too. I mean, you can really tell when you when you put on that chain mail and you walk around in it, you can tell, okay, this if you did this regularly, it would develop muscles in you that are not currently developed, and in a way that is probably different than they're developed in our modern world. And you would develop a capacity to to 
to uh, do this naturally, which these guys grew up wearing this kind of stuff. So they were very much adapted to it. But it's, it's just kind of intriguing. I think we let's check that power chat thing here. Oh, wrong thing. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Anyway, well, what I was saying was just, I guess it's more the layers that kind of got you really heated up. That At least that was my experience. It, I was not aware of like, oh, wow, I'm wearing this armor that's just like burning to the touch, even though I was in the glaring sun, you know, beating down on me. Um, if Sam is here, he could probably speak to this a bit in terms of he's got a lot more experience wearing armor out, outside and in the out of doors than I do. But uh, it's yeah, it's it's more you get very sweaty for sure. I mean, I can tell you right now, those guys were sweating. But you know, you also kind of wonder when you think about the medieval world. You know, you're really thinking about just such a totally different life experience, right? So these are people who I think you know, like imagine growing up and you're never in air conditioning. You're never in a an, an environment that is altered to suit your your tastes. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that medieval people maybe just weren't as sensitive to discomfort as we we are. I mean, we know they were. You know, they talk about how oh, this is miserable, it's hot. You know, we know we know that they 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 were human. They were just like us. But you know, like for example, the sleeping arrangements in the in the Middle Ages. I mean, um, you know, you tended to sleep, you know, uh, with like if if you're if you're fairly well off, you've got hangings around your bed that would have been pretty hot in most circumstances unless it's really cold outside but uh i don't know it's just it's, just, it's, it's kind of interesting when you think about that i mean like imagine like never you know you know the clothing that pe that the medieval people wore in general was not as comfortable as i mean like you know this type of clothing is very comfortable wool attire is not you know and that's what everybody's wearing your whole life i mean I don't know. And let's jump back to the questions. I know I kind of start rambling, you guys, but welcome, Bleak. Good to have you here. And we got Chris. Do you think Manuel Comnenus played a part in the decline of the Byzantine Empire? Uh, now, what I have heard historians say about him is that he overextended things. He was he was a very capable ruler. He uh, had the loyalty of the empire. But he was was ambitious, and he was especially. It's kind of funny because the most successful emperors seem to really push hard in the West. Like Manuel was very concerned to expand in Italy and try to re regain territory there. And Basil II was was the same. He tended more to focus on campaigning in the West and the East. You know, against the Muslims was kind of an afterthought for some of these guys. And Manuel Comnenus, yeah, it's like at the very end. He really tried to hit the Turks hard, and he he uh, he was defeated in a pretty important battle. Um, but yeah, that's I I, I won't I don't think uh, I'm going to go on too much detail about that right now, Chris. But what I have heard is that he kind of overextended the empire and set up a situation in which once you had. Uh, the sort of internal collapse with the really poor series of emperors, a lot of the stuff he had worked so hard to maintain sort of fell apart more quickly because they, they were overextended. Uh, let's see here. Walker Smith, a question for anyone who uses armor in general. Exactly. D. Uh, D says an acton was used by the Saracen silk for emirs. And uh, she's talking about different types of clothing. Yeah, the, the clothing was more luxurious and uh, comfortable in the East than it was in the Latin Christian world. Uh, just because, you know, the, the, the Muslim and Byzantine worlds were wealthier than the Latin West at first, although that changed rapidly in the 12th and 13th centuries. Interestingly, uh, they think that the Westerners tend to eat more meat than the, the uh, Muslims and the Byzantines, though, which is kind of an interesting. Nalu. This is our good friend Nalu, who is uh, in Spain. In the Battle of the Navas de Tolosa, the French went away because it was too hot in Hispania. Were they just being drama queens then? You know what? 
that's the explanation given by the Spanish chroniclers about why the French left. Uh, the French forces that were involved in Las Navas de Tolosa were fairly small. Not all of them left, but a lot of them left pretty early on. I don't think we really know what that was about. It might have just been... Um, there's other explanations, too. The other explanation is that they weren't allowed to plunder the Saracens, and that annoyed them, so they left. I think that the explanations recorded... I mean, I don't think they actually left because they were hot. I, I, I really don't think that that was it. Uh, I think it had more to do with... Um, I think the being being denied plunder is probably a lot more plausible, but also just there was a need to kind of explain why the so many of the French contingents abandoned the crusade. And also there was kind of a bit of, you know, I don't want to say nationalistic feeling, but kind of proto patriotism, you know, we don't really have those countries the way we think of it today, but, you know, regional pride, I guess we could say uh, the, the, um, the Castilian chroniclers wanted to emphasize the, the uh, achievements of the Spanish and there was kind of an emphasis. In fact, I think uh, Archbishop Rodrigo even says that the he was glad that the French left because it left all the glory to to the Spaniards. Nalu, they were heavy cavalry. Yes, they were. Yes, definitely. And you know, I, I don't want to totally discount that. I'm sure that, especially like you know, especially if like you you uh, maybe you are there. Because, you know, again, we, people went on crusade for a lot of reasons. Some people went on crusade because it was an opportunity to to plunder, definitely. Um, especially when it was a bit closer to home, you know. You can almost imagine somebody, okay, I'm in the south of France. You know, I'll go down to Spain for a little bit and, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. That's a lot different than um, going off to the Holy Land. It's hard to imagine somebody going uh, in the Middle Ages across the whole Mediterranean to the Holy land because I think they're going to get rich. And the evidence is that that was not really, that was not really a thing. And this is Scott Amos with his happy cat there. Mm. Ah, you gotta love that coffee. You gotta love the coffee. Especially when your kids wake you up in the morning, early in the morning. <laughs> uh, Scott says, when did surcoats actually come into use? They started being used in the mid 12th century. Uh, but they were, but they were really heavily used by the 13th century, as far as we know. Zitron. Okay, let me jump to some other questions here. Sheila says, "I don't think I could handle all of that on me. I'd feel claustrophobic. Plus, I'm five one and on the small side." Well, as a woman, you wouldn't be expected to do it. So that's that's the thing to remember. You know, it's really interesting. It's really interesting how people in our world debate this issue of whether or not women were warriors when it when it's so clear from the source material that they were not. Um, but I th again, I think it kind of says something about the world we come from. I mean, we I've heard. It said before that people in the 21st century West are the least materialistic people in history, which might be kind of um, interesting to think about because we think of ourselves as, oh, well, aren't we very materialistic? I mean, we've got a lot of stuff. You know, we just go to Walmart and get whatever we want. But, you know, we're kind of concerned with unreal things like TV shows or, you know, clicks on the Internet or this digital space everybody's in medieval people were thinking about cattle about bed uh bedding about you know furniture like uh you know you kind of get the sense that the medieval world was so much more tangible everything was just you know the physical reality of things which is kind of interesting how how they they also seem to be so in tune with this spiritual reality but uh whereas in our world our lives are kind of like, you know, think about how, how many of us have jobs where we sit in a cubicle and, you know, type into forms or, you know, fill out something on a computer that doesn't really even involve uh, much physical labor at all or much anything tangible, like, you know, making something. Like I remember when my friend Levi started posting how he was making all this stuff out of wood, I was like, yeah, you're, 
that's a, a real physical thing you've got there, you know? Um, so anyway, where was I going with it? <laughs> I'm going to be, you guys are going to watch me become one of these like rambling old men on, on these live streams. <laughs> Well, you're talking about how claustrophobic you'd feel. Yeah, I, just to, to go back to that, um, I do think uh, when you put all that stuff on, that it, that's I kind of felt that way too. Like I was kind of thinking, okay, I'm ready to get this off. You know, this just kind of feels like I'm in a you're kind of walking around in a uh, in in like a I don't know, like like a a little mini coffin or something. I mean, you know, it's not that bad, but you, you feel pretty confined. Simonius, do you think the Fourth Crusade would have succeeded had it not diverted to Constantinople? Um, I think that, um, well, we kind of know how things went. The Fourth Crusade was was supposed to go to Egypt, and we kind of know how things went down when the Franks would try to conquer Egypt. They did it with two major expeditions, the Fifth Crusade and the Seventh Crusade, both of which failed, but which came close to succeeding. Uh, they tended to do well when they were attacking the coast, when you're, when they were besieging these coastal cities like Damietta, they could take them and they could hold them. The problem was when they went inland and in, on both occasions, the armies they had were too small. Uh, they, they probably needed much larger armies to actually do that, to pull that off. I think that uh, if the, if the crusaders had ever gone to Egypt and just said, you know what, we're just going to conquer the coast. We're going to take Alexandria and Damietta and all the stuff in between and, and build some castles to protect them and set up like this. I mean, I think that probably could have been done and probably could have been maintained in a, in a way that was similar to the uh, Palestinian coast and Syrian coast. Um, now I think the Muslims would have contested that qu quite, uh, quite um, seriously, but then the question comes up, I mean, would they have been able to do it? Because the Ayyubids, after Saladin, really had trouble pushing back against the Crusaders on the coast. And uh, they often weren't, you know, it wasn't until the Crusaders started marching inland that, uh, that they really were able to get it together against them. So, interesting to think about. I don't know. The Fourth Crusade was uh, not as well organized as uh, Louis, the, Louis the Ninth's Crusade. It was not as centrally planned. It was not as uh, meticulously planned. Louis the Ninth's Crusade was one of was it may have been up and well up until that point definitely it was the most detailed in its planning in the way it was provisioned. Uh, Richard the Lionheart's was also very high up there, but just the ability to uh, to organize a campaign like that had taken a step up within that time frame. And Louis was meticulously planned. Uh, again, the main problem with it was it was too small. He had 15,000 men, something like this, and that was not enough. And uh, when he was a captive, held captive by the Ayubids, they even asked him about that. They said, why did you think this would work out? And he said, I had faith in God. Again, something we kind of have to remember with medieval people is they were willing to uh, to kind of say, well, they were willing to kind of put it, believe that God might pull something off like that, even if it wasn't necessarily physically possible. All right. So. This is fun, guys. I'm enjoying this as usual. I'm glad we're doing this. Uh, D has a good comment here. Wool breathes. I wore a World War II uniform as a display. 95 degrees on the tarmac, still comfortable. Okay, interesting. Well, I don't really have much experience wearing wool. So maybe it's not uh, the, way, the way we often imagine it. I do have this goal, though. You guys might not, not know this, but my long-term goal is, is to be kind of a farmer. And I do want to have sheep someday. So so that, that's the goal, to have a little piece of land and have some sheep and stuff like that. So when that happens, I'll make a video for you guys where we uh, we uh, shear a sheep and, you know, we'll see. Who knows? Maybe we'll make some of our own clothes. We'll see. 
uh, uh, let's see. Did Baldwin wear a mask or is that Hollywood? Um, it's Hollywood. D. Baldwin's mask was pure Hollywood. Thank you, D. I appreciate that. She's kind of tag teaming for me here on the questions. Uh, Tony, I'm not sure if leper masks were ever a thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's no indication that Baldwin covered his face at all, honestly. Uh, I mean, if he did, the sources just don't say anything about it. Now, there there are a couple of times where William of Tyre says that the people of the kingdom were alarmed by the king's appearance. So that to me would imply that he was, uh, he was not covering his face. Okay. Let's see here. Now Lou says being denied plunder sounds more likely to be honest. Yeah. Especially because it was such a small number. Uh, you know, there, there was not a major leader from France who was involved in the, in the, Las Navas de Tolosa Crusade, which is one of the best crusades in history. You guys have got to, you've got to uh, dive into that one really deep. The best sources for it are in Spanish, or at least the scholarship type sources, if you want to read like modern modern scholarly accounts of it. But by the way, you should come visit the museum of the Navas of Las Navas de Tolosa. Also, we have the Camelot Castle from Monty Python, the Holy Grail. Yes, uh, Spain is definitely uh, a destination I want to get to. It sits in Valencia. All right, Valencia is somewhere I, I really want to. I really want to go there. I didn't realize that uh, there was an entire museum for Las Navas de Tolosa in Nalu. That's that's pretty interesting. Okay, guys, I've got to get back to work. Um, we'll do a couple more questions. Uh, you guys might find this interesting. The video I'm working on now is about. It asks the question, who was the first king of England? Maybe you guys can uh, tell me what you think the answer to that is. But I'm kind of doing something to coincide a bit with uh, the recent passing of the, the Queen of England. So this video is going to be about the origins of the British monarchy. But it gives me a chance to jump back to the, the Anglo-Saxons in the 9th and 10th centuries. Lambert. Can I ask you to speculate as to how you think the confrontation between Saladin and Nur ad-Din would have played out had Nur ad-Din not passed away before he engaged Saladin in Egypt? Wow. Uh, you know, I think it would have been great. <laughs> I, th I think it's really unfortunate that um, uh, I guess I'm giving away my my preferences by saying that there. But yeah, um, that was really unfortunate for the Crusader states that uh, Nur ad-Din died when he did, because at that point you had two very strong Muslim leaders who were dead set against each other. And I can tell you right now, Nur ad-Din, when he died, one of the last things he said was, was something to the effect of, uh, everything I have done is going to come to nothing because, because of Saladin. And Saladin was clearly not, was clearly intent on resisting Nur ad-Din. So yeah, I think it would have been a full on civil war. I think it would have been very destructive for uh, for Muslim Egypt and Muslim Syria. And I think it would have been hugely helpful to the Crusades. Hugely. I think that Hattin does not happen in that case. Because for one thing, both of them would have been going to the Kingdom of Jerusalem for help. Or been trying to court the Kingdom of Jerusalem for help. Because with Saladin... His, his Muslim opponents were so much more asymmetrical. And it would it kind of be a situation similar to uh, the Ayyubid princes after Saladin, except that none of them were on par with Nur ad-Din or Saladin in terms of their leadership abilities. So, yeah, that was a stroke of misfortune for the Crusader states, for sure. And a definite, I mean, I'm sure Saladin was was thanking Allah when he um, he heard about that. I mean, that was hugely helpful to him. And I don't know who would have won, honestly, if anybody would have won. Probably, it probably would have been an issue of, you know, I think Saladin was probably on shakier ground just because Nur ad-Din, uh, before Saladin annihilated the, the Zengids, they were a very powerful, um, 
a very powerful block. And a uh, Salomon was was such a such an upstart at that point. So pretty interesting. Yeah, that, that is an interesting thing to think about. Like what what would have happened with that? But yeah, I think it would have been it would have been a major war, and it would have been. Uh, I can tell you right now, we would not be remembering Saladin as the champion of jihad. He would have been, um, you know, he would have been a Muslim leader, mainly remembered for fighting another Muslim leader. It's just, it's, it would have been just such a different game. And, you know, that whole thing kind of, it kind of brings into question a lot of, um, you know, like what Saladin was really trying to achieve. I mean, I don't think it's impossible that, you know, holy war and political victory were both simultaneous goals that he had. I think they were clearly, um, and, you know, I think we kind of have to leave it at that in some in some respects. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is the fact that he was more concerned with maintaining his own power base doesn't mean that he was an insincere uh, warrior for Islam as well. You know, obviously for the Crusaders, that went hand in hand as well. I mean, Richard the Lionheart was uh, a committed crusader, but he was also committed to the power of the Angevins and his own power. You know, which, you know, the reality is, if you are a ruler, you have to be concerned with that. Because, well, for one thing, if you are, I mean, in some ways you think about it, if you are, like, you can imagine this kind of logic. Saladin is thinking to himself, if I don't defeat this guy, then I can't lead the grand jihad against the crusaders. The question always comes up, well, why didn't he just submit to Nur ad-Din? Nur ad-Din was his natural lord anyway. Why did he rebel against him? Um, so interesting, interesting discussion point. Okay, guys, let's do like one more question, and then we'll kind of we'll kind of call it for the day, and I will get back to my video about uh, the history of the British monarchy, the origins, uh, or who was the first king of England is the question the video asks. So um, let's see, LG. We already kind of talked about this. Uh, they come circuits come into use in the 12th century and they kind of really come into widespread use by the 13th century last question Lori, are you going to make a cameo in the knights of the cross film uh not this pilot episode it's already been filmed and so i won't be in that but who knows maybe i'll uh, i'll jump in there for the the other episodes when we make those so speaking of which guys uh knights of the cross.com let's go ahead and end by Jumping over there to the website for Knights of the Cross. And then we'll call it a day. Check out KnightsOfTheCross.com. Help out over there if you can. And um, all right. Thank you, Lambert. Appreciate it. I will be back on Friday. We do these every Tuesday and Friday at uh, noon Eastern time, 11 a.m. Central time, U.S. time. Uh, so let's, yeah, we'll, we'll do another coffee and the crusades on Friday. Talk to you guys then.